Join our free WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. Part 1 You are going to hear a conversation about renting an apartment. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 1 to 6. How can I help you, sir? Hi, I'm interested in renting an apartment in your building. Can you show me around inside? Sure, my pleasure. Do you know what kind of apartment you're looking for? I'm thinking of something for my best friend and I. The apartment doesn't have to be too big, just something comfortable for the two of us. I'm looking for a kitchen, two bedrooms and a bathroom. Just something simple. OK, well, let me show you what we have to offer. We divide our apartments into three categories. There are standard apartments, upgraded standard apartments and luxury apartments. Please follow me. This apartment just went up for rent yesterday. The old tenants moved into a larger one. This apartment is what I call the standard apartment. It's small, but has everything you need. The kitchen comes with a refrigerator, an oven and a stove. There is one bathroom with a shower, but no bathtub. The rooms are a good size, and both have their own closets. The living room has enough space for a couch. We will provide a television for you. These apartments are very popular with students because they are affordable and practical. Right now, we are renting these out for only $1,000 a month. I think this is a little bit on the small side. There's no space for a dining table or even for an extra desk. We will both need room to study. If there are guests over, we hope to be able to have a dining table big enough for at least four people. Do you have anything slightly larger? Maybe just an apartment with a bigger living room? Well, let's take a look. Right now, we also have an opening for a luxury apartment. This apartment is larger. It has three bedrooms, and all three are larger than the last one. And there are two bathrooms, and all have bathtubs. The kitchen is also larger, and come with an additional dishwasher and freezer. The living space has plenty of space for a dining room. How much is the rent on these apartments? These are more expensive, usually in the $2,500 range. Don't forget that there is an, an additional bedroom, so you could find another roommate to lower the cost. Hmm, I think that's a little bit on the expensive side. We don't really have the time to find another roommate, so it's probably better to stick with the two bedroom places. Is there anything between these two? Come with me. I can show you this apartment right now, but there are people living in it. There are no more of these kinds of apartments available at this moment, but if you decide that you like it, I can put you on the waiting list, and as soon as we have openings, you will be contacted. Sure, let's take a look. This is the upgraded standard apartment. As you can see, it's larger than the other two bedroom apartment. There are two bedrooms and two bathrooms, one in each room. The living room comes with a television, but no furniture. The kitchen is around the same size as the other smaller apartment. The basic difference is the additional bathroom and larger living room. These rent for around $1,400. Now look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 7 to 10. Seems like a good deal. 
Do you know when an apartment like this will be available? That's hard to say. I know these people who live here right now should be graduating soon, so they might be moving out. Well, I guess I'll put my name on the waiting list. Hopefully, there'll be an opening as soon as possible. That sounds like a good plan. I will notify you as soon as we have vacancies. You will have to leave us some information and a student identification number. Sure, no problem. My full name is Robert Jack Browning. Could I have your age, please? I'm 38. Your major? I'm studying biology. How about naming some of your hobbies? Hmm, fishing, golf, watching movies, and spending time with my family. Sounds like a good life. What is the price range of the apartment you are looking for? Somewhere between a thousand dollars to fifteen hundred dollars. Your student identification number, please. QS four five eight nine zero. Could you repeat that? QS four five eight nine zero. Lastly, could you leave us a phone number? Okay, it's area code two three six five eight zero double two eight seven. Thank you very much. I will give you a call as soon as possible. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You now have some time to read questions eleven to twenty first. Listen to the guided tour commentary and answer questions eleven to twenty. Welcome to the library tour. We'll begin our tour of this level of the library here at the entrance. Then we'll go in a clockwise direction. So, first of all, over here on the left, next to the entrance, is a touchscreen information service. These computers can be used at any time to get general information about the library and how it works. In front of the touchscreen information service are the catalogues. As you can see, it's a computerised catalog system, and it's very easy to use. The catalogues are linked up to the other libraries at the university, so make sure you check which library a book is in when you are trying to locate a particular item. Next, along here on the left, we have the circulation desk for borrowing and returning books. The returns area. The place for returned books and other items is at the end of the circulation desk near closed reserve. Closed reserve, as most of you probably know, is a collection of books that are in high demand, so they are on restricted circulation. If a book is on closed reserve, you can only borrow it to use within the library for three hours at a time. Over there in the corner are the shelves for newspapers. The library has an extensive collection of local and international English language newspapers. They are kept on those shelves for one month and then stored elsewhere. As we continue on our tour, around to the right, this large central section is the reference section. Reference texts cannot be borrowed for use outside the library; they must be used within the library. All these shelves in the centre of this level are the reference section. Now, the stairs here on the left lead to level two only. On level two are most of the law books. To go up to the other levels of the library, you have to use a lift. Beside the stairs are the restrooms for this floor. Now, as we walk around this corner to the right, 
This large room on the left is the Audio Visual Resource Centre. You can come here if you wish to listen to a tape or watch one of the library's videos. Next to the Audio Visual Resource Centre is the photocopying room. There are 15 copiers for student use and we've recently added a colour copier. The system for copying uses cards, not coins. You can buy a photocopy card from the technician in charge of the photocopying room or from the information desk if he isn't here at the time. On our right, these work tables are for student use, especially for small groups to work together. Or you and your colleagues can use the conference room, which is that small room there next to the lockers. You can work on group projects in the conference room without disturbing anyone and there's a conference room on each level of the library. The round desk in front of the lockers is the information desk. If you need help using the catalogues or you need to organise a loan from another library, the information desk is the place to come. And finally, here, beside the exit doors, these two shelves contain current magazines and journals. Like the newspapers, they are kept here for a time and then stored elsewhere. OK, that's the end of the tour of this level of the library. I'll leave you to look around yourselves now and if you need any further help, please ask at the information desk. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two students discussing a project they have to do as part of a literature course on great books. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi, Joey. How are you doing? I heard you were sick. Oh, hi, Olivia. Yeah, I had a virus last week, and I missed a whole pile of lectures, like the first one on the great books in literature, where Dr. Castle gave us all the information about the semester project. I can give you copies of the handouts. I've got them right here. But that's okay. I already collected the handouts, but I'm not very clear about all the details. I know we each have to choose an individual author. I think I'm going to do Carlos Castaneda. I'm really interested in South American literature. Have you checked he's on the list that Dr. Castle gave us? We can't just choose anyone. Yeah, I checked. It's okay. Who did you choose? Well, I was thinking of choosing Ernest Hemingway, but then I thought, no, I'll do a British author, not an American one. So I chose Emily Bronte. Okay. And first of all, it says we have to read a biography of our author. I guess it's okay if we just look up information about him on the Internet? No, it's got to be a full-length book. I think the minimum length's 250 pages. There's a list of biographies. Didn't you get that? Oh, right. I didn't realize we had to stick with that. So what do we have to do when we've read the biography? Well, then we have to choose one work by the writer. Again, it's got to be something quite long. We can't just read a short story. But I guess a collection of short stories would be okay? Yes, or even a collection of poems, they said. But I think most people are doing novels. I'm going to do Wuthering Heights. I've read it before, but I really want to read it again now I've found out more about the writer. And then the video. We have to make a short video about our author and about the book. 
How long has it got to be? A minute. What? Like 60 seconds? And we got to give all the important information about their life and the book we choose? <laughs> well, you can't do everything. I wrote it down somewhere. Yes, Dr. Castle said we had to find or write a short passage that helps to explain the author's passion for writing, why they're a writer. So we can back this up with reference to important events in the writer's life, if they're relevant. But it's up to us, really. The video's meant to portray the essence of the writer's life and the piece of writing we choose. So when we read the biography, we have to think about what kind of person our writer is. Yes, and the historical context and so on. So for my writer, Emily Bronte, the biography gave a really strong impression of the place where she lived and the countryside around. Right. I'm beginning to get the idea. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Uh, can I check the other requirements with you? Sure. The handout said after we'd read the biography, we had to read the work we'd chosen by our author and choose a passage that's typical in some way, that typifies the author's interests and style. Yes, but at the same time, it has to relate to the biographical extract you choose, there's got to be some sort of theme linking them. Okay, I'm with you. And then you have to think about the video. So are we meant to dramatize the scene we choose? I guess we could, but there's not a lot of time for that. I think it's more how we can use things like sound effects to create the atmosphere, the feeling we want. And presumably visuals as well? Yeah, of course. I mean, I suppose that's the whole point of making a video. But whatever we use has to be historically in keeping with the author. We can use things like digital image processing to do it all. So we can use any computer software we want? Sure. And it's important that we use a range, not just one software program. That's actually one of the things we're assessed on. Okay. Oh, and something else that's apparently really important is to keep track of the materials we use and to acknowledge them. Including stuff we download off the internet, presumably? Yeah, so our video has to list all the material used with details of the source in a bibliography at the end. Okay, and you were talking about assessment of the project. Did they give us the criteria? I couldn't find anything on the handout. Sure, he gave us them in the lecture. Let's see, you get 25% just for getting all the components done. That's both sets of reading and the video. Then the second part is actually how successful we are at getting the essence of the work. They call that content, and that counts for 50%. Then the last 25% is on the video itself, the artistic and technical side. Great. Well, that sounds a lot of work, but a whole lot better than just handing in a paper. But thanks a lot, Olivia. You're welcome. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk on bullying in the workplace given by a university lecturer to a group of students. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 33.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 33. Complete the notes made by one of the students present. Write no more than three words for each answer. Good morning. My name is Dr. Mervyn Forrest, and I specialize in management techniques and training. I've been invited here today to talk to you about the cost to the economy of bad management. And what I would like to dwell on first is an area that has recently been exercising everyone, and that is coercion in the workplace, or to put it more simply, bullying. It has been estimated that bullying at work costs the British economy up to four billion pounds a year in lost working time and in legal fees. And with the problem apparently on the increase, it is time that managers took on board what is happening. I would like to think that what is perceived as bullying is nothing more than lack of experience, insecurity, or lack of awareness on the part of managers and not a conscious effort to attack someone, but that is perhaps a case of, um, of my being naive or over-hopeful. Before we break up into groups to look at the first task on the handout you've got, I'd like to give you a start with some of the main bullying methods that have been identified so far. Basically, what I'm going to do here is to give you examples of one or two points. Uh, can you all read the OHP clearly? Yes? Right, off we go. Now answer questions 34 to 40. Write no more than three words for each answer. As you listen to the talk, complete the notes made by one of the students present. The first item on the list is giving people tasks which managers themselves cannot do and which are therefore impossible to achieve. This is in fact a very common strategy used by managers to manage their subordinates. It gives certain people a false sense of security as they watch others failing while they try to achieve the goals set. Another simple bullying technique is constantly moving the goalposts, especially when one's employees are in the middle of a task. This is not bad management, it is just plain stupid. All targets and goals set should be easily achieved within a realistic timescale. Sending memos to someone else criticizing the performance of a task where the individual has no way of replying is another common technique, especially when the manager concerned does not reply or makes it impossible for subordinates to contact him or her by not answering the telephone or not replying to emails. This is not the style of a sound manager, but rather the antics of someone with emotional problems. If you behave like that, don't expect your staff to respect you. And now, the technological bully. It is interesting how all tools designed to help can be turned into dangerous weapons. The urgent email bully is fast becoming a problem in the office. Employees turn on their computers to be faced with a string of badly worded emails, making instant and often unrealistic demands, which reveal the hysteria mode of management. Have you ever felt a sense of dread before looking at your email, even your personal messages? All companies should develop a company strategy whereby there is an email code of practice with offensive messages being forwarded to a designated person for appropriate action. I would now like you to break up into groups and brainstorm other bullying techniques which you think you may have experienced and, perhaps, if you're honest, which you have been party to. I can think of at least nine more bullying strategies. I would also like you to consider ways in which you think that each of the techniques on your list can be countered. Is everyone clear as to what the task is? Yes? 
Okay, you've got twenty minutes to do this. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.